We're going to read verses 1 through, we're, we're, we're just going to read verses 1 and 2. The whole passage is 1 through 12, but I think we'll just read verses 1 and 2. And if you have your Bibles, please read along with me. That would be very helpful. Um, I don't read so well, so any help that I can get in reading, thank you, sir. Any help that I can get in reading would be extremely helpful. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, please read along with me, and then after that I'll pray, and then we'll all be seated. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the Christmas story, Lord, every year as we meditate upon that. It uh, encourages us. It's uh, really a time of meditation and adoration. And we, Lord, we not only do we enjoy it, but we need it. And we're so thankful for it. And we ask now, Lord, you bless the preaching of your word. Encourage our hearts. Help us to see that our life is not all about us. But it's all about you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Now I want to just go ahead and read the rest of this, verse 3 through 12, and uh, then uh, we'll get into the message this morning, verses, starting in verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, Art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. History tells us a lot about this Herod. There's, you know, when you get to be a king or some famous person, a lot of people write things about you. And so history tells us that this Herod was a guy that was a bit paranoid. He was greatly concerned about his position, was afraid of losing his position. So the news of another king coming from a band of wise men would certainly be a bit disconcerting to him. It bothered him. And that's why you see in verse 3 it says that he was troubled. It's interesting that same Greek word is used in John chapter 5 and verse 4 when it talks about the waters being stirred or agitated. So it bothered him. It agitated him. He was not happy about the situation. In fact, Herod himself was such an evil man that even his own servants, even those closest to him, hated him. He was the kind of man that didn't really have a friend in the world, his, historically speaking. And it was only because of having favor with Rome that he maintained his position and his power. He was such a bad guy that he had been guilty on, uh, of numerous other crimes, which included killing his own wife, and as we learned a couple of days ago, even three of his sons and several other relatives. Kind of reminds me of Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Anyway, moving on. That was my political statement for the day. Interestingly enough, Herod was not even a Jew. A lot of people think of him as being a Jew, but he wasn't really a Jew. He was the second son of a man named Antipor, who was what was referred to as an Edomian. And the Edomians were basically um, descendants of the Edomites, and the Edomites were the offspring of Esau, so bad blood going back a lot of generations there. But he was appointed as Herod in around 41 to 40 B.C. And so he reigned 
all of that time, all the way up to 4 BC, in which time he finally died. So he was not a Jew, and honestly, not even really religious. But he wanted the Jews to be, to, to like him, because they had been complaining about him, and Rome was kind of starting to look at him a little bit. So he wanted to get into the Jews' good graces, so he took the small temple that they had built. Now, they had gone into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. They'd come back to Jerusalem, and they rebuilt the city and rebuilt the walls, and they rebuilt the temple. But the temple wasn't that big, magnificent, glorious thing that Solomon had built. It was now this little thing, and some people weren't really happy about it. And so Herod, knowing the history, decided to make the Jews happy. He was going to rebuild this temple, and he started this renovation program that lasted close to 50 years before they were done with it. Did you notice that Herod, however, as we read through the passage, he seems really anxious about Jesus coming? In fact, he doesn't ask for information. The Bible says he demanded, tell me, I'm the king, tell me. What really amazes me is as we read through this, the scribes, they know the answer. He goes to them and he says, tell me, where is he? They said, well, there's this prophecy back in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And the prophecy says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee he shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been from old, from everlasting. So clearly, King Herod, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. They knew this. They knew all about the coming of the Messiah. The problem was, their Bible knowledge was only academic and not very practical. Not only did they know that he was going to be born in Bethlehem, they should have also known from the prophecies in Daniel right about the time it would happen. I mean, they might not have figured out the day. I mean, we're still working on that one. But that they would have known basically at least the year or within, you know, a couple of years, you know, they would have known that. You would have thought that it would have been waiting, looking, in great anticipation, but the scribes were not. Now, there were a few that were, but for the most part, they were not. Their knowledge was not personal or meaningful to them. You would have thought that they would have gone to the wise men and they would have said, oh, you're going to Bethlehem? Oh, can we go? We want to see him too. Because they knew the scripture so well. But the fact is, they didn't really have a desire to see Jesus. They had no desire for Christ in their daily affairs. They were perfectly happy in their religion. They were perfectly happy to do and continue doing what they were doing. And so what does God do? God sends some wise men to find Jesus because the scribes, who should have been wise, didn't really care. So I wonder sometimes how many people are like that today. How many of us really look forward to the coming of the Lord? I mean, we talk about it, right? Even in Sunday school this morning, we've been going through the prophecies of the New Testament. We talked about the coming of the Lord and all of that stuff. We talk about it. It's interesting. It's exciting. But what does that do for me on Monday instead of Sunday? How does that impact my life? So Herod, he sends the wise men on to Bethlehem to find the Christ child. Now suppose Herod had said, we know what he said, but what what if... Herod had said, if there's a king born around here, I'm going to get rid of him. I'm going to kill him. So go down to Bethlehem and find him so I can kill him. What if he would have said that? What if he would have sent soldiers to Bethlehem? I assure you that he would never have found the child because I I just believe that God would have hidden him. But Herod knew that that wasn't going to work. So what does he do? He says to the wise men, you know, I really hope you find him. I'd like to worship him too. So can you go down and find him? And then once you find him, come and let me know and I'll go worship him too. That is his clever plan. Deception. So he said he wanted to go down and worship Jesus. But of course, what he really wanted to do was to kill him. Now, according to the text, the Bible says that he secretly called the wise men. I don't know if you picked up on that. But he secretly called the wise men. Why secretly? What's he trying to hide? What is it that he doesn't want everybody to know? Why is he trying to keep his business a secret? Well, because he never really intended to give up his throne to anyone anyway. 
He doesn't want anybody to really know where the king is. He wants to know where the king is so he can go kill him and get it all over with and he can continue to reign. Now Matthew, as he writes, he makes it very clear that this star, this star is an amazing star. This star was unusual, supernatural. And I know that there have been astronomers that said, well, during that time period, you know, the planets were all lined up and there was this brightness in the sky and all of that. Yeah, okay, maybe that's true. I don't know. I'm not an astronomer. I can't, you know, I can't tell you whether that's true or not. Let's just assume it was. Okay, let's assume it was true. But the reality is this star was not like any other star. This star moved through the sky. They were able to follow this star. There was a point where it stopped in the sky. And it stopped low enough that the wise men knew which house it was pointing to. Now I want you to imagine on the night sky just today, you go out and you see a star. And the star is like right over there somewhere. And you say, I wonder which house that star is over. I'm going to walk until I get under that star, and that way I'll know which house it's under. How far do you suppose you can walk before you get that star directly overhead? If ever. Because I don't know if you know this, but the world is round, and it's moving all the time, and stars are out there. They're moving too, by the way. And you know, the moon is moving, the sun is moving, everything is moving. Good luck trying to get under that thing. All right? This is not a natural occurrence. It was miraculous. And we don't need to try to find an explanation. The Bible just simply says it happened. So we take it as it is. I want you to notice what Herod does, though. He says to the wise men, he tells them to, to go find the young child. Did that catch your attention? The young child. He knew that the wise men had already been traveling a while. In fact, Herod even asked them when the star first appeared to them. And most likely... These wise men had been traveling from as far away as Parthia or the region around Babylon where the Jews had been exiled centuries before. And if you remember from yesterday and the day before, we talked a little bit about who the wise men most likely were. So they had been traveling for some time now to arrive to where Jesus was. And most likely, and based upon when the star first appeared, Herod knew that he was not seeking a newborn baby. He was seeking a toddler, and by now, possibly even up to two years old. Because remember what he said? Kill all the babies under two. I'm going to assume that he gave it a little cushion both ways, you know. Yeah, he might be about a year old, but just to be safe, kill the two-year-olds and the one-year-olds. Get them all. And that's his plan. He wants to make sure to get the Christ child. On the other hand, the wise men came to Jerusalem because they considered it to be the city of the king. That's why they come to Jerusalem. The, the king of Israel, of course he's going to rule from Jerusalem. Even we know that. Now Jesus was not born in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem. And this is significant. Somehow these wise men knew that the king of Israel would rule from Jerusalem, so they go to Jerusalem. And they're right. He will someday rule. But the first coming of Christ was not to rule. It was to die. And that's what Calvary is all about. The first coming of Christ was to save us. Thus, the living bread came to the house of bread. Remember last night's message. So, who were these wise men? We really don't know a lot about them. But some things from the Bible is pretty clear. They were obviously pretty perceptive men. They noticed an unusual star. They recognized that it had significance, that it was pointing to an unusual event. They realized that God was at work in the world and they wanted to be involved in what God was doing. And so that's wisdom. That's being a wise man, getting involved in what God is doing. The wise men, if you study in history, you'll find out that this group of men were educated in science and philosophy and medical skills and religious mysteries in the countries, even beyond the Euphrates. Uh, if there was some thing or philosophy out there, they would study it and they would learn it. Now, I'm not saying that they believed it all, but they knew it. They were truly the know-it-alls. They were the kind of guys that if you had a question about anything, you could ask them. They might not know everything, but they know something. This is the kind of people these wise men were. A lot of Bible scholars believe that they are the remnants of a group of people that Daniel of the Old Testament had been in charge of 
around 600 years earlier. Now go back to, we talked about this a couple of nights ago, just a little bit. And I didn't want to get too much into it because I wanted to get more into it today. So go to Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 2. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 2. And this is in the story of Daniel 600 years earlier. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 2 it says, The king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams so they came and stood before the king. Now, I don't want to get into the whole story, but these men, these men were the successors of Daniel and they probably knew something of the promises of the scriptures. Why do I say that? Because in Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 48. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, it says, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and what? And made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. So they couldn't interpret the king's dream, but Daniel could. And so the king says, Daniel, you're better than them. You're in charge. And he puts Daniel in charge of all of these wise men. Now, I've no doubt that once Daniel was in charge, he began to do what Daniel always did. And he began to put a focus on God. And in doing so, he may have very well have taught them the prophecy from Numbers chapter 24. In Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, this is the prophecy I believe that Daniel would have taught these men. Numbers 24 verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. A star mentioned and the people group mentioned. So I think those wise men were sitting around and they looked up and they saw a significant, special, supernatural kind of star. It wasn't like all the other stars. They knew what was supposed to be up in the sky because after all, they studied astronomy. But they look up there and, they, and the first guy goes, hey, that's special. What's going on? And maybe the second wise man said, you know, I, I kind of remember there being a prophecy in one of those Jews books about that. Let's go see what it says. And I think they figured out that that star was this star mentioned in Numbers 24. Now, interestingly enough, there's a, a, a uh, translation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew. But there's a translation into Greek. The Greek translation is called the Septuagint. Now, what's interesting to me is if you go back and you read that passage in Daniel, the Greek word for the wise men there is the word magos. Magos comes from the Septuagint. It's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Magos is the word that is used in Daniel chapter 2. And it's translated as magos. And we, we use a word that's similar to that. It sounds like the word magician, right? That's where we get the word magician. Nowadays, we think of a magician as being, you know, hey, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. You know, we know that it's all fake. Back then, I'm sure they used prestidigitation back then too. But uh, they also, you know, delved into some of the dark occult kind of stuff. And they were trying to do things by the power of demons and devils and they may have not even known it, but for them, some of that stuff was even real. And so they had this word magos because these men knew it all. They were special. These were the wise men. And it's interesting because when you go over to the New Testament, you're reading Matthew chapter 2, guess what Greek word is used there? The word magos. So these men were most likely from the area of ancient Babylon, quite educated, in all the wisdom of the ancient science and religion. And, and notice that they, and also, by the way, as we read through Matthew chapter 2, did anyone read the word king? No? Remember the song? We three kings of Orient. Now, I'm not bashing Christmas tradition or anything, but these guys are not kings, all right? Where did they get the idea that they were kings? I don't know wasn't important enough to me to do the research to figure that out, but they're not kings. Also, how many were there? We don't know that either. They brought three gifts, but I mean, there might have been only two of them. Or there could have been 20 of them. 
And then they got camels and mules and backpacks and people. I mean, after all, they are going to travel 600 miles through some of the roughest territory that you can imagine. I'm pretty sure they just didn't, you know, put on their Reeboks to go out for a little walk. So there's a lot of things that we learn about Christmas from Christmas cards or from the songs or whatever. Um, and sometimes those things aren't accurate. The idea that there were three wise men just comes from three gifts. Now, there may not have been three wise men, but that's not what's important. There are three things, however, that I see here about these wise men that I think are important. And the first thing that I see here is that these men were very persistent. They were persistent. We cannot be sure how far they traveled, but I'm sure it was a it was not, you know, just a quick overnight trip. They didn't just do a quick turn and burn to Osan. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like that. They traveled a long distance. I, I looked it up this morning, the distance from Jerusalem to uh, to uh, Babylon, which, you know, that area is roughly about 575 to 600 miles, depending upon exactly where in that area they started from. Um, it's quite a distance. And they traveled this whole distance. And I'm sure that there were cloudy nights when they had to wait a while before they could see the star. Unless it was lower than the clouds, and that's possible too, I guess. Based upon Herod's question, Herod asked the question, when did you see the star? Then Herod's response to kill all the babies that were two years old and under. Some think that the wise men might have traveled for two years. And I thought about that. And personally, I'm pretty sure that they traveled for a long time. But, I mean, if they only traveled 20 miles a day, which is not too hard to do when you've got animals and so forth, or even walking. You could, you could do 20 miles a day. Now, I don't know if you could do 20 miles a day every day for several weeks. Uh, at some point, you might want to go, you know what? I'm just not walking today. I don't know. But the bottom line is, if you just did 20 miles a day on foot, you could still very easily go from, from you know, basically Baghdad. Think Baghdad. It's that area, okay? You could go from there to Jerusalem in 30 days. Traveling 20 miles a day. 30 days. But still, that's quite a trip. And some days you're going to go slower because the terrain is rough. And some days you might go faster because it's flat. Roughly 30 days. But just to give these guys the benefit of the doubt, let's give them two times that. And let's give them 60 days. Or three times that and give them 90 days. That's not even nowhere near close to three or two years. So I really don't know that they necessarily traveled for two years. Now, I'm still amazed that these guys would even travel that far for that long, carrying gifts for a baby. And by the way, gold is not exactly the lightest gift in the bag. And they traveled, and by all human logic, why would they even do this? Because they're going to see a child that's not even going to remember that they stopped by. What is your earliest memory? My earliest memory, I think, is from about two and a half to three years old. That's my earliest memory. I remember riding my little three-wheeled tricycle in the backyard and the neighbor's dog attacking me. It was a significant emotional event. I'll never forget it. I remember running around the house and crying to my dad and him telling me, don't be a girl. Yeah, that was my dad. He's the kind of guy he was. Nice guy. Really tough. So I'm pretty sure that when they went to see the Christ child, that they weren't thinking, he'll remember us when he grows up and it's going to be good. That's not what they were thinking. To give gifts and worship to a baby that they knew was going to grow up to become a king. And by the time, and here's another thing, by the time Jesus grew up to become a king, in their way of thinking, I mean, they would have been, that would be what, 20, 30 years, right? These wise men were probably already 30, 40, 50 years old. They might not even be around. They might not even be living. And yet, they made a 600 mile trip and they didn't buy a bus ticket in those days you walked or rode on the back of camels and I assume because they were men of prominence that they had beasts of burden to carry them but I wouldn't make a trip like that not to see a baby unless it was Jesus I guess maybe I would but they did and they never gave up why would they be willing to do this because they knew that they had been blessed the earth had been blessed by the birth of the King of Kings, the long-awaited Messiah has finally come. So they come to worship. 
and they were going to do whatever they had to do to get there. And this is the same response, I'm telling you, the same response that we need to have. To do whatever we need to, to worship the Lord. Why? Because He's the Lord. He's our Savior. Does that mean anything to you? You get to go to heaven. You don't have to go to hell now because Jesus has interceded and He's died on the cross for you. That ought to be meaningful enough for me to get my lazy tail out of bed on a Sunday morning and come to church. I mean, it ought to do that for me. Turn to Psalm 27, verse 8. The Lord wants us to be persistent. He wants us to do whatever we need to to get closer to Him, to know Him better, to serve Him from a heart of gratitude. Psalm 27, verse 8. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Did you get that? God, when, God, when you say, look for me, I'm going to look for you. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. And here's another thought. The persistence of the wise men paid off. When they found the baby, That it, it paid off. And, and if, we, if we will sincerely seek the Lord, he'll be found of us too. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So there's a condition. If Jesus is just kind of, you know, some fleeting thing, maybe second, third, fourth on your priority, you won't find him. But when you search for him with your whole heart, you will. Now go back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. The wise men, the second thing, first they were persistent. Secondly, they had a purpose. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold, or gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Have you ever wondered how all the details came together? And here's the wise man in a far off land, and somebody looks up and he sees a star. Now, now, first of all, how did they know what it meant? Secondly, and, you know, maybe the Old Testament prophecies, and they know that, and the prophecy is far from clear, however. A star out of Jacob does not give you a lot of information. And then, how did they know they were supposed to follow the star? What, was there a sign or something up there, like, you know, on the flight line, follow me? <laughs> the truck driving up, follow me, right? But somehow they knew, and they're following the star. And did they actually follow the star to Jerusalem? Now, the Bible says that they saw the star in the east, but it doesn't say they actually followed it. They followed it after they got to Jerusalem. They saw the star and they followed it to Bethlehem. But there's nothing saying that they actually followed the star from Baghdad to Jerusalem. They looked up and they saw the star and they went to Jerusalem. That's what the passage says. For all we know, they might have just saw the star and then just decided, hey, I need to go to Jerusalem because that's where the king of the Jews is going to be born. And maybe that's what they did. All we know is that somehow they knew what to do. So they headed out with one purpose, one thought in mind to worship. And I wonder sometimes how many of us come to church with that same kind of thinking. Are we here to worship? Or are we just, you know, punching our spiritual time card, ting, ting, Sunday morning, did the church thing. I'm good to go. If you're here to worship, then you will concentrate on worship. If you worship, you will love the Lord and you will try to please Him. That's what worship is all about. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That's what worship is. And then after they left Jerusalem, they headed to Bethlehem. The wise men were miraculously guided to the Christ child by the same star that they saw in the east. Matthew 2 verse 9 tells us that. They looked up and they said, hey, there it is. It's the same star. Now, whether they followed it to Jerusalem or not, I don't know. But when they got to Jerusalem, they went, hey, it's that same star. The other one says, how do you know it's the same star? It's the same color and it's got seven points like it did before. 
Must be the same star. Let's follow it. I don't know how they knew, but they knew, and they followed the same star. I want you to think about the typical nativity scene that you see. In your mind, think about it right now. You see a stable, and you see Mary and Joseph and the baby, and it's lying in the feeding trough, and, and there's animals around, and then there's some shepherds there, and maybe some angels overhead, and the three kings. Right? Three kings. And this is where the typical nativity scene really, really falls apart. There is no mention in Matthew 2 of a manger. No mention of animals. No straw on the ground. Rather, Jesus was, as it says in verse 11, in a house. Surprise, surprise. The wise men did not get there the same night Jesus was born. They got there later. And there's lots of discussions of how much later that was. Some people say Jesus was two. I don't know. At some point, Jesus was no longer an infant, though. He's a young child. The wise men obviously visited Jesus after all of that was over. The shepherds have come and gone. The whole thing is over. It could have been as much as a year later. Some people say even two years later. I don't know if I'd push it that far, but that's what some people say. They had a purpose. They came to worship Jesus. Now I want you to look at verse 11 again. The wise men, third point was, they had presence. So they were persistent, they had a purpose, and they had presence. Matthew 2, 11, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And sometimes I wonder if these wise men had any idea of the significance of their gifts. But we do. We can study the scriptures, and I'll share some of this with you in a minute. I mean, did they choose these specific gifts for a specific reason? If so, they must have had a greater understanding of the ministry and uh, of the Messiah than what most people realize they did. But if not then I stand in awe of God's sovereign direction in leading these men with these gifts. One way or the other, I'm still in awe. Three gifts. What's the meaning of each one? Well, gold, you think of gold, you naturally think of royalty. And of course, Jesus is the chosen king of the Jews. Ultimately, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who's going to rule over the entire earth. Revelation 19.16, speaking of his second advent, says he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then you've got frankincense, which was an incense intimately connected with the priesthood and the temple sacrifices. It foreshadows the fact that Jesus would serve as our high priest and that he would give himself as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for the sins of all mankind. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. We find out we have a high priest. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. Just a few chapters over. Hebrews chapter 9, 11 through 14. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified through the purifying of the flesh, how much more? shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And I should also mention that frankincense speaks to me of the fragrance of Christ's life. I have some frankincense and some myrrh up in my office. And years ago, I think it was like back in like 2006 or so uh, in our church in Chunju. And I had just gone to Israel and I came back with this stuff and we decided that for Christmas we were going to burn some frankincense to see what it smelled like. Never again. 
I mean, it was like, <laughs> open the window, I'm just trying to air it out. It's wintertime, right? It's cold. We were already cold. The building didn't heat very well in those days, but that's some strong stuff. It is a strong fragrance. It's a good fragrance, but it is quite overpowering, if you will. And then myrrh. Myrrh, to me, is most interesting. The other two are pretty straightforward, but myrrh has more of a sobering symbolism. You see, when a person died, an embalming perfume was wrapped with the body to help cover up the stench of death. You might, you might remember from John chapter 19 that Jesus' own body was wrapped in linen with myrrh and aloes. You can read about that in John chapter 19, verses 39 and 40. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So that's what they would do. They would use myrrh to wrap the body with. It's also very interesting to study the facts concerning Christ's second coming. At his birth, he was given gold and frankincense and myrrh. Well, what does the Bible say about a second coming? This is pretty interesting. Let's do a little comparison here. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 6. The last part of verse 6, and again, this is referring to his second coming. It says, they shall bring gold and incense, that's frankincense, by the way, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. What's missing? Myrrh. Myrrh. Hmm. Myrrh. Myrrh is missing. They don't bring myrrh to the second coming because that speaks of his death. When he comes the second time, nothing will speak of his death. Myrrh was also an ingredient in the anointing oil in Exodus chapter 30 that the priest would use to anoint or sanctify the priest as well as other items in the tabernacle. So there, myrrh speaks of Christ's priestly work. A number of Old Testament passages, and I could rattle them off to you if you're interested, but it also speaks of myrrh as being just basically a perfume. Women would wear myrrh. I guess it was expensive, but it smelled good, and so they would wear it. It'd be like Chanel number no. 9, right? $60 a bottle. And you use it very... You ever see You ever see him put perfume on? $60 a bottle. We're going to keep that as long as possible. Right? It was used for other things too, like certain purification rites, like in Esther chapter 2 and verse 12. So it spoke of his purity. So myrrh speaks a lot to us. Now please note that when the wise men saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and they worshipped him. If there is ever a time when they could have worshipped Mary, they didn't. No one else, nothing else, Christ and Christ alone was worshipped and is to be worshipped. there was ever a time when it could have been different, it was that day. But that's not what happened. They worshiped Jesus and they presented to him these treasures. What is a baby going to do with a bar of gold? I don't know if it was a bar. The Bible doesn't say that. But imagine it's a bar. What would a baby do with a bar of gold? He doesn't know the significance of that or the value of that. Now, Jesus might have because after all, he was God in the flesh. But the fact is, typically babies don't know that. And they certainly can't lift it. What's a baby going to do with frankincense and myrrh? These significant gifts, they were presented to Jesus. They're treasures. And as we study the scriptures, we find out their value. And I wonder, in our worship, do we offer the Lord anything of value? Is our worship true worship to him? Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to ponder for a moment just how far God would go to reach a lost soul. And Christmas reminds us that the world is full of accidents from God, if you will. They're events that he has orchestrated. It's really a part of his plan to save man. Do you know the Lord? May God help you to come to Christ for this Christmas. 
If you're a child of God and you know Him already, evaluate your worship. Are you giving Him something that's worthy? Something that speaks of His value to you? As the piano begins to play, if God has spoken to you, won't you come and pray? How has the Lord spoken to you?